You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Rollin', 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 keep those doggies rollin', 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 it's a good one too, yeah. but that's not what prompted it. No. How's it going, everybody? You are listening to an episode of The Command Zone. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How is it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. This is potentially episode 127, we think. Potentially? Well, you're out of town right now. I'm technically out of town while you're hearing this. So, yeah, that's true. That has a tendency to like get us, oh, we'll push that back and we'll do this other thing that, <laughs> that came up. <laughs> the Craig episode we recorded like a month ago and came out, what, last week? <laughs> last or week, two weeks yeah. ago, two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's how it works. It's the <laughs> magic of... Show business. Show business? I don't know. I don't know. Right Podcasting word. show Podcast business. Podcast business. Yeah, podcast business. Um, so we. this is the Command Zone. This is a Commander podcast, in case this is the very first episode you're ever listening to. And this show is brought to you by a wonderful sponsor, Card Kingdom, who has been the sponsor of the show now for... A few months? Yeah, a few months. Uh, it's been awesome. We have loved having Card Kingdom as a partner. If you guys don't know, Card Kingdom is a retail store in Washington, Seattle, Washington, two of them. And it's also a online retailer. And we've had some uh, great feedback from uh, everyone tweeting at us, talking about uh, shout outs to Card Kingdom. Josh has them right now. Yeah, we get these all the time. We Once in a while, we'll call them out. So um, Ramp1 on Twitter, actually at Ramp1R, mm -hmm. I don't know what that R is. Anyway, said, quick shout out to Card Kingdom, fantastic prompt service. Jimmy and Josh, thanks for introducing such a great place. Yeah, and that is certainly something they are known for. They get your cards to you incredibly quickly. Uh, their, their cards are always exactly what they rate them, if not even better quality. Uh, and... As far as I can tell, Card Kingdom has some of the best customer service of any company I've ever worked with ever. So, great company. Make sure you guys buy some cards at cardkingdom.com slash command zone to support the podcast. Yeah, make sure to use the affiliate link, cardkingdom.com slash command zone, so that uh, you're supporting us. 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 The S's sound pretty good in these mics. Yeah. Usually they sound bad in some mics. Sibilance. Sibilance, Simba, Simba. Simba, king of the jungle. Everyone uh, out there is like, ah, my ears. My ears. Sorry, it everybody. Hisses. Um, now, this is a fat pack from Kaladesh. That is a fat pack from Kaladesh. Actually, no, it's a bundle. Oh, it's a bundle. Sorry, they renamed them. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's totally my bad. Um, it's and, the artist formerly known as Fat Pack. <laughs> uh, last week on the show, we gave away a uh, uh, some of the intro decks. Oh yeah, from two Kaladesh. of the Planeswalker decks. Yeah, and all you had to do is follow us on Twitter. This week, we're giving this box bundle of Kaladesh away to a very special listener who sent us an email and inspired the topic that you're going to hear today. Yeah, so we got an email from Sam Mackey. And the title of the email is, What is Card Draw? I'm going to read the entire email. It's a little bit long, but we're going to... It really got us thinking, and there's some really good points. And we hadn't really talked about a lot of this stuff in depth on the show yet. Mm -hmm. So it was a fun one to sort of delve deep into and make into an entire show. So Sam, because he wrote this great email, is winning this bundle. Bundle. Calder's bundle. Ten packs and a... Uh, a bunch of lands, a uh, spin down. Uh, the, the box is new as well. Uh, there's there's like also a little poster a little, in there. A little card holder as well for uh, Some for deck cards. boxes. Yeah. All right, so Sam's email says, Hey, guys, I've been trying to figure out something for my deck building woes. From your advice, I subscribe to the 10 mana ramp, 10 card draw philosophy, but I'm not quite sure how to define those terms. To this point, the end goal of drawing cards to gain card advantage or to see more of your deck, question mark. For example, suppose I play Demonic Tutor. I have drawn a card, but I do not have card advantage. Should I count the tutor towards the 10 draw spells for the deck? On the same note, cantrips also technically draw cards, but do not provide a card advantage. Should they count as well? Inversely, playing a one-sided board wipe such as Mouse Calcify or In Garrick's Wake will certainly gain me card advantage, does, but does not draw me extra cards. Can these cards be counted among my 10 draw spells despite not getting me more cards from my library? Essentially, would you consider a deck that ran 10 tutors and no other draw spells to meet your prerequisites? How about a deck with 10 cantrips and no other draw spells, or 10 one-sided wraths? Might these cards be considered as one half of a draw spell, or should they not count at all? Finally, how about cards like Stonehewer Giant, Stoneforge Mystic, or Godo Bandit Warlord? Would you count them as card-drawn man ramp? Those cards all uh, go find equipment, by the way. Mm -hmm. 
In a Voltron or other equipment deck, it would seem to make sense as they tutor a card and can circumvent casting it. Even though they don't explicitly give me give you more mana, they still get you ahead on mana. If I had those three in a list, would you say I only needed seven more ramp or draw spells each? So a lot of interesting questions, a lot of stuff brought up by Sam. Um, we're going to talk about, sort of run down a lot of his points and discuss it, because I think this is something that probably a lot of people are out there thinking. Mm -hmm. We talk all the time about card draw, how important it is. You know, we always, obviously, people know about our sort of like rough guidelines of yeah. 10 mana ramp, 10 card draw spells. And people also are always asking, how do I cut cards in my deck? Can can this card substitute for that one? Yada, right. Yada, yada. So you might be thinking, oh, well, card draw, could, if it can mean board wipes, then all of a sudden I don't need as much card draw. So we're going to mm -hmm. go through that. Um, so first off, what is card advantage? Jimmy, what is card advantage to you? Uh, card advantage to me is when I have an advantage over other players because I've got more cards than them. But card advantage is not just the amount of cards in your hand, right? It yes. counts the battlefield. In in one-on-one, -on -one, it's a lot easier to calculate. I do this all the time on Moto. I don't know if you do. Mm -hmm. But I'll look at how many cards I have on the battlefield and how many are in my hand. I total that up. So let's say I've got five lands, two creatures, that's seven, and mm -hmm. four cards. That means I have 11. And then I look at my opponents, and I say, oh, they've got five lands, yep. two creatures, but only three cards. Oh, so I'm either up a card or we're even depending on who went first, who's on the play and who's on the draw. Yep. And, and then you can also look in the graveyard and sort of calculate like exactly how many cards. Sometimes you look and you go, oh, they've got nine cards in the graveyard. I've only got four and our boards and hands are equal. That means I could be up like five cards in that scenario. Maybe I cast some draw spells. Maybe they had to chump block a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I cast a, a wrath, something else that like one of my cards killed a whole bunch of their cards. And that's kind of the essence of card advantage. Unless they milled those cards or those they cards were milled. True, um, true. But yeah, it's a great way to... I always, like, if I'm winning or losing a game, I always look at the graveyard to see, like, who's just done more stuff? Mm -hmm. And has it been... Like, for instance, if someone plays three spells and does as much as you did with ten spells they're they're doing a good job of whatever they're doing and you're they like probably to... have card advantage on yeah. you yeah yeah in one-on-one -on -one you can calculate it you can actually find out because you know all the information you need how many mm -hmm. cards are in their graveyard how many cards are on the battlefield how many cards are in uh their hands also you can look and say oh how many cards are in their library especially on moto or something where it just has the numbers you can yeah. figure out like who's got more of that resource which is cards available to them at the time it gets a little sticky in multiplayer yeah, because there's a lot more happening. There's a lot more reasons cards are in people's hands or in the graveyard. For instance, if two players have Consecrated Sphinx out, they just start drawing, like, oh, great, you guys both have 40 cards in your hand. I think that's card advantage. That's but a I, lot of card but advantage. But I can't yeah. actually count. I'm not going to sit there and be like, how many cards do you have in your hand? You just have a lot more than me. Yeah. Also, cards in graveyards, and in some formats, this is true, too, like limited or one-on-one formats. Mm -hmm. But in general, in EDH, like, Sometimes you have to count cards in graveyards differently. Like, if they're playing Carador, those might just sort of be in their hand or Marin. Yeah. You know, so it's not as cut and dry. It's a lot harder to figure out. But the idea of card advantage basically boils down to this idea that, like, if one of my cards is roughly worth the equivalent of one of my opponent's cards, right? Mm -hmm. and now, this is not always true. Obviously, there's mana costs and all kinds of things. But, you know, if I have Swords to Plowshares, that's basically going to get rid of a creature at some point. Right. So. That's going to be parity. I'm going to get their card for you by using one of my cards. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep doing that, then who eventually wins that that game of attrition? It's going to be the person who has a card or a couple cards that actually give them card advantage. So, so right. I, I suddenly play a card that it kills two of your creatures for one of my cards. Now, all of a sudden, I'm up one card on you because... We're assuming that other players doing the same thing back to you. They play, You play a 3-3, three, three, they play a 3-3, mm -hmm. three, three, those kind of... You know, they trade or whatever. And then all of a sudden, at the end of all that, I have one extra card than you do, and you it just can attack you or do whatever, and yeah. that's my advantage in the game. Yeah, if anyone plays chess out there, it's a very similar idea. One of the, uh, like professional ways to beat someone in chess is to get one piece ahead and then to trade everything off one for one and at the end of the game you're ahead that one piece and that's all you need because now you have a king and a pawn and they have a king and you're gonna win that game if you know how to play it right so that's 
chess piece advantage as well at a certain point. It's basically, that's a really good example because it's basically the same as card advantage. And if yeah. you can somehow get two pieces up where you're taking, you manage to take two of their pieces without trading, yeah. then you're in an even better position, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, for instance, a fork is a very common thing in chess where you place a piece in one place and it can kill two things and they have to essentially choose, all right, which one am I going to lose? And you get to take that either for free or you get advantage because that piece is stronger. For instance, if you're like 1-1 one, one death touch kills their 10-10 ten, ten trample monster, you kind of win in that scenario. True, yeah. And chess, if your pawn can somehow take out their knight, then mm -hmm. also you've traded up. Yeah, yeah. Pretty interesting. Um, so let's talk about some examples of card advantage. So some of these are obvious, and some you have to think about for a second. Like Wrath of God can be card advantage, and Wrath of God destroys all creatures that can't be regenerated. So it will kill your own creatures too. But on a board where your opponents, and we're talking in multiplayer, if they average have you know four to five creatures each. Mm -hmm then, and let's say you only have two, then all of a sudden you could be up two cards on everybody. Yeah. Because if you killed two of your cards, you used a card, you destroy five cards from all of them, that's card advantage, right? If you have even less creatures and they have even more, the card advantage can be bigger. And in, in multiplayer, I would say, like, trying to figure out exactly the number that you're up on people is not as big a deal. In limited, yeah. it sort of is. In limited, you'll feel the difference a lot more. Yeah. Because you're also drawing from a smaller deck, you're only uh, playing against one person. You're only playing against one person. You kind of can, you kind of know the cards in your deck a lot better than Commander. Like, if, if knowing be like, all right, I have ten cards left because I've drawn X number of cards. I know my bomb. I've scribed three of the bomb. I know my bomb is within the top five cards. Like card advantage there is like, okay, so because I'm able to draw more of my deck, I'm I'm able to know when I'm able to you know safely attack because I know I'm gonna probably draw my bomb this turn or whatever. Yeah. So it's I think it's less important for us to know exactly how much card advantage you get. Sometimes it's important, mm -hmm. but just to know that it can. So Wrath of God, obviously. I think it's pretty obvious to people how it gets card advantage. It, yeah. can, it can destroy a thousand creatures. Yeah. I mean, technically, it could destroy infinite number of creatures um, for only one card. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, another example of card advantage would be Reese the Redeemed. Uh, this is a one mana spell that essentially makes tokens and that makes, eventually doubles your token. Makes, the amount yeah, of tokens a lot more tokens. So in this case, the card advantage is literally one card is providing you with, if each of those tokens counted as a card, even though they're sort of, I would say like a token is like half to three quarters of a real card. It's still card advantage because you're essentially, with one card, able to generate a lot of value as opposed to one person that just plays a 2-2 bear. It's kind of like Reese is drawing cards from an entirely different deck. He's like drawing mm -hmm. cards out of thin air and then putting them onto the table. And those are still magic. cards, right? Yeah. He's just going, Whoo. that's, it. if you can't see the video, you didn't see me do the magic <laughs> hand thing. I think the, the sound effect worked. Okay. We got, we got there. Um, <laughs> it's like kitchen Our, table fables. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Um, so that's kind of what Reese is doing. And then at a certain point, Reese really turbocharges that. And like, you've got seven tokens make seven new ones. That's obviously a couple of cards. And yeah. then the next turn makes 14 new tokens. <laughs> yeah, and he spirals out of control pretty fast. Yeah, but, but that is card advantage because those cards are affecting the game as cards do. Mm -hmm. So even though you didn't draw them off the top of your deck and actually cast physical cards, Reese is casting one ones or or if you're making three three tokens with something else is making those. Yeah. So that is, again, card advantage. Um, yeah, the next one is Jingataxius. Core Augur. This card's stupid. It's eight, eight, <laughs> eight and two blue for a five four legendary creature, a Praetor, has flash. At the beginning of your end step, draw seven cards. Mm. Each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by seven. Hmm. So it makes <laughs> it's so much card yeah, advantage. Barring other effects, it makes your opponents discard their hand at the end of their turns right. um, during their discard phase because their hand size is zero. So this is another card advantage engine, and any mass discard, or any, really most discard spells that dis make your opponent discard more than, mm -hmm. like, Mind Rot's technically card advantage, because right. that's a card that makes an opponent discard two cards. You use one card, you got two of their cards. Um, Jinga Taxius is just what we do in Commander, because we don't do small things. Um, no, we that, go ham in Commander. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it makes you draw cards, but ignoring that part of it, it does make your opponent's discard their hand and so that's card advantage because you took cards away from your opponents and not just a couple of cards that's like massive card advantage you it's all gone speaking of mind rot this is like the ultimate mind rot yeah this isn't actually this is a great card that i've it's identity crisis it's two white white black black for a sorcery and it says exile all all cards in target player's hand and graveyard from the game so that's 
I mean, aside from the fact that it's single target, right? So you're like, okay, it's not as good multiplayer. Actually, this card can really house some decks because getting rid of their entire graveyard, if you do this to a Carador deck, they're just out of luck. You have no hand, you have no graveyard. So it, all of a sudden, all of your options for what you're going to be able to do are just shrunk to nothing. Mm -hmm. So again, that's card advantage because you got rid of a whole bunch of stuff for one card. Yep. Um, the last one... And there's a lot in these different categories. Obviously, we're just co covering different categories, but it's Acidic Slime. So Acidic Slime, again, you wouldn't think of this as card advantage. It is in Commander in certain decks. So it's three mm -hmm. green green for a 2-2 two, two ooze, has Death Touch, but it says when Acidic Slime enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact, enchantment, or land. So this is only card advantage in certain decks because of the ability to reuse it. Yeah. It's sort of similar to Reese in that regard. With the enter the battlefield effect, yeah, yeah. you can, it, I mean, if you're able to recur this, blink it, do whatever, then you can obviously just destroy a lot of things. And I've seen these card, this card do a lot of work. Yeah, so all of a sudden, if you're blinking Acidic Slime, you know, every round of the table, then it might, it might destroy five or six different, you know, lands, artifacts, and enchantments. That's mm -hmm. one card that destroyed five or six different things. So again, card advantage. Now, if you only play it, and then you you don't blink it or reuse it, it's still a little bit of card advantage because it destroyed something, mm -hmm. and then it's a 2-2 creature. So provided that 2-2 that two -two part of it can get you some sort of, can trade or somehow get you a card later, then you could get two for one even without blinking it. Yeah, a card like Necrotal has first strike, so that is relevant in some cases. Um, also, just a card that says draw five cards for one is card advantage. So, but obviously. You know. But that's also card draw, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. Um, so the interesting question is, why is card advantage good? I mean, I like being advantaged. It's the it's same. It's a good vantage point. I think up it's here. the same reason that like having more mana than your opponent is good. Mm -hmm. uh, also, sort of the same reason that having more life than your opponent is good. It's a resource, right? It's one of the resources in the game. So, it being ahead on it is advantage you have a better chance to win than if you're the one behind now that doesn't mean that you're a lock to win that you cannot lose yeah i would say that most people consider card advantage to be one of the primary resources cards in, cards available to you mm -hmm. as a as a good indicator of who's going to win the game but it's not the end all be all right so we can definitely think of circumstances where you have card advantage but you're not you don't win the game yeah, so for instance, this happened the other night. We had two Consecrated Sphinxes out. I had 40 cards in my hand. I was super stoked. I'm like, I'm going to win this game. I've got all this card advantage. I've got all these little things I can do stuff. And then one person just had Avacyn out, and everything was indestructible. And every turn when you're getting beat in the face with a giant flyer, you're like, oh, well. Uh, I have 50 cards, but what is cool. if none of them deal with that problem, then <laughs> I just get hit five times and I die, right? Maybe I should rebuild that deck <laughs> to deal with Avacyn. <laughs> this definitely happens a, a lot. And it's easier to tell in like 1v1 mm -hmm. in limited where like the, the, I'd say the common scenario is like you've got like a big ground guy, like a 6-6, six, six, and they've got like a 3-3 three, three flyer. Right. And they're attacking you and you're attacking them. And then they just chump block you three times and kill you with the flyer. They chump block you three times. That means you're three cards up on them, you know, depending on what the chump blockers were, obviously. But that doesn't matter because your life total is at zero. Mm -hmm. So it didn't. the cards didn't exactly matter in that scenario. So that's one instance where card advantage is not the end-all be-all. Yeah, and this is another great, great example here. If you just don't have enough mana to do the things your deck wants to do, so your opponent plays a two-drop, a three-drop, and a four-drop, and is attacking every turn or removes the creature that you try to block, and you're just stuck at three mana, and you're like, all right, well, I'll cast Divination. I'm not going to affect the board, but I'm going to draw two cards for this one. Ooh, card advantage doesn't matter because in this case, your card advantage does not match what the, the board is demanding you need to do in order to survive. So that's a really good segue to our next um, part of the topic because divination is what we would call card draw. It's also card advantage. And this was an interesting thing when we started breaking down, you know, this discussion in Sam's email was the idea that like, what's the difference between card draw and card advantage? And I sort of came to all card draw is card advantage, but mm -hmm. not all card advantage is card draw. The question here, similar to the other one, is what is card draw? Well, this one's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Card draw is any effect or spell or creature or just anything that has is going to increase the number of cards above what you would normally have by just drawing one the turn. Yep. So it's just... And I would, I would say it has a reasonable expectation of doing that, right? So, mm -hmm. so one of our favorite cards to talk about, Ristic Study is a card that it could get destroyed. You know, they could untap, and during their upkeep, you know, they could 
kill, or it doesn't have to be their upkeep. During their main phase, they could anguish on making it. Did they pay one for that? Pay anguish? one, and then all of a sudden you haven't drawn any cards for Rhystic Study. Um, so it doesn't always work, but in general, you have a pretty reasonable expectation that Rhystic Study is going to draw you some cards. So I, I would say that card draw is any card that pretty reasonably you're going to draw cards. So again, we have examples. Um, a classic one is Harmonize. Yeah, green card draw. Yeah, and Harmonize is just draw three cards as a sorcery. It costs four mana, two, and two green. So th there's a million cards in this category, right? Uh, Sphinx's Revelation, right. Brain Geyser, just Divination, like you said earlier. These are just one-time use. They draw you cards. Anything that draws you more than the one card will give you an expectation of more cards in hand than you would have otherwise had, right? Right. This is very different than a cantrip, which we talked about earlier and what Sam mentioned in his email, which is a card that... A cantrip means like a minor spell or minor effect uh, from Dungeons & Dragons, but what it means in Magic the Gathering and other card games is a card that only replaces itself. So there are a lot of cards that are like one mana, you choose how every player votes this turn, draw a card. So you're not having card draw off of it, you're still spending a man to pay to play a card, and then you're replacing that card. So as a cantrip, it's not card draw in the way that gets you card advantage. Um, the next example is Phyrexian Arena. So that's one black black for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you draw a card and you lose one life. So it's a one-sided Howling Mine that kind of causes you damage. Um, mm -hmm. That's obviously going to just draw you one extra card per turn. So that's card draw. Yeah, and that's it's a nice version of card draw because it's not a spell. It's not right. something that you do once. Like over a long game, Phyrexian Arena is going to be much better than a Harmonize or a Divination is. This is actually a counterpoint to my statement earlier. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, because Howling Mine is the next one. This is a two mana artifact. At the beginning of each player's draw step, if Howling Mine is untapped, that player draws an additional card. Well, that is card draw, right. but it's not card advantage. Because everyone's drawing that card. Yep. But you are drawing more cards, so it's technically a card draw. Well, it's, it is card advantage if you are able to flash it out. Un untap it. Yeah, untap Or sorry, tap it, untap it. Yeah. yeah, or tap it or untap it. So if you're able to be the first person that draws off of this, then it becomes card advantage at that moment until it goes to the next player. So the person actually that draws last off of it is the last person to receive the card draw. And technically, everyone before that player has card advantage over them. Yeah, interesting case. But it is still card draw, obviously. Yeah. Oh, I like this next one a lot especially because it's a masterpiece now. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Um, I got one. Oh, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Mind's Eye, five mana artifact. Whenever an opponent draws a card, you may pay one generic mana. If you do, draw a card. So very similar to Rhystic Study, uh, except, except that you're, you're paying, paying the it, mana. Yeah. It's, it's worse, but it goes in any deck. But it's this idea that something happens, then you pay mana and you draw cards. And again, you might draw zero off that card. Mm -hmm. But I think you can reasonably, reasonably expect to draw cards from Mind's Eye. Yeah, I mean, it costs five to drop, so usually you're not going to be using it the first turn it's around, but it's any time a player plays a spell. So it's it's pretty good, honestly, uh, if you're able to sink the mana into it somehow. Ooh, uh, boy, the next, next one, one, one of the best <laughs> cards in Magic's history, Skull Clamp. It's one mana for an equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, minus one, and whenever equipped creature dies, draw two cards. And, and it has equip an, it. Yeah, equip cost of one. Of one. You know that's you know they they wanted to make it worse right when they put that minus yeah, one on it yeah made it better because now all your tokens that are one ones just cost it says one mana draw two cards yeah this card is unbelievable um, but it's a very conditional case it still costs mana to do but one mana for two cards and you lose a creature so you're kind of getting a little less at card advantage and card draw when you're doing this but it's still drawing you a ton of cards. Cards that you wouldn't otherwise have, too. That's why I like the thing about card draw. If it if it's getting you a card that you otherwise wouldn't have had, then the, the payment of, like, sacrificing a creature or equipping out a creature and having it die is not that bad because you can mitigate it with the cards you're drawing. Oh, this is like... I think you play this card more than anybody else. Me? Yeah, yeah it It's actually like true. It. I feel... Uh, maybe you just have really good luck drawing it in all my games, but yeah, it's Yeah, I feel like Sphinx. I have it in, like, three or four decks, but I don't play... I don't get it out that much. Hard not to play it in every deck yeah. <laughs> that has blue. Um, four blue, blue for a creature Sphinx. It's a four, six with flying, and whenever an opponent draws a card, you may draw two cards. This is unbelievable. It's whenever an opponent draws a card. So if an opponent has an effect like Phyrexian Arena, they draw two cards a turn, but it's in two different instances... You, you draw, draw four, four cards. It's crazy. If somebody gets a Consecrated Sphinx out and then somebody else clones it or gets their own out, then all of a sudden those two players just draw as many cards as they feel like. Yeah. Even if they, if, if that person has Divination, you're drawing four cards off it because they're drawing two cards. So it's, they drew a card. It's, it's so good. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. It's out um, of control. Yeah. It's, yeah, that card. 
Um, okay, so here's one that's similar. Oh, no, sorry. One more. Arcanus the Omnipotent. Oh, is, this guy's awesome, too. Yep. This is a creature that you can tap and draw three cards. It has some other abilities, but this is, again, the ability on a creature, but it's not when it enters the battlefield. You actually activate it. Yeah, I, I like it. This card, I feel like, doesn't see enough play. It is kind of hard to cast at six mana, three of it being three blue, blue. But yeah. you know what? It's pretty good. It also takes a round at the table. Consecrated Sphinx costs six mana, but you start drawing your cards on the player's next turn, whereas right. Arcanus can't actually activate without other effects until your your next turn. So, mm-hmm. um, Oh, we should talk about this. Yeah, a new, yeah. A new form of card draw, uh, which is Red's version of card draw. Uh, the new Chandra has it. Uh, Torch of Defiance. So basically, uh, Mara referred to it as Impulsive Draw. If you guys want to, you actually should check out the episode where he interviewed him at PAX. Uh, so Impulsive Draw means the an ability where you exile the top card of your library, and then you are able to cast that card until end of turn, usually. Um, Chandra just has that as her plus one. A lot of other cards in red now have that. Uh, Abbot of Carol Keep is yep. one. I think uh, Outpost Siege is Outpost another. Siege, yeah. I think Chandra Pyromaster actually had it. Oh, yeah, you're right. I think so as well. I think you're correct. So it's sort of Red's new, and by new we mean in the last few years, um, form of card draw, which is, it is card draw because mm-hmm. it's giving you extra cards every turn. Now, it's limited in the fact that you have to cast it that turn, Yeah, which is a downside, but... If you're playing Boros or you're mono red, it's kind of, you kind of have to do with what you got. Yep. And uh, the last example of card draw, which is sort of the equivalent of the Acidic Slime, in that it's a creature with card draw attached to it, and it only really cards, counts as card advantage if you can recur it or mm-hmm. blink it or reuse it, is Elvish Visionary, which is a two-drop 1-1, one, one, draws a card when it enters the battlefield. So, again, obviously this is card draw. If in Carador you can just cast it three or four times or blink it with rune. Yeah. Uh, special cases for card draw. Now, these are not card advantage. They are uh, it's card parody. So a card like Merfolk Looter, or Rummaging Goblin. So it's looting and rummaging. Looting is an ability where you draw a card, then discard a card. And rummaging is an ability where you do the opposite, where you discard the card, then draw a card. So looting is technically, typically a blue effect, yep. and rummaging is a red effect. Now, these can be card advantage in a weird sort of way. So if you've got cards in your deck that would be dead, mm-hmm. let's say lands, you know, when you've already got plenty of lands, or a card that like destroys an artifact, but there's no artifacts on the board. Then if you loot it away, so you draw a card and then discard that, you've got a card in your hand. It's not, I, don't, I, I guess it's hard to sort of quantify what you would call that, but I would call it card draw in that case. It, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure how you would refer to it. Yeah. I would refer to it as card draw as well. For instance, like a Carador deck again, or if you want to put anger in the graveyard, being able to throw stuff into the bin, I think is one of the, it's kind of like, a more advanced idea of of playing magic that I think a lot of newer players don't understand until they sort of cross that threshold where they're like, holy crap, looting is amazing in this deck because I want these cards to be in the graveyard. I want Wonder in there so my creatures are flying. That's a really good point. If you're in a deck like, you know, a Carador deck or a Sharoom deck or a Mm -hmm. million decks Marin deck that want things in their graveyard where basically the stuff in your graveyard is equivalent to sort of being in your hand, then all of a sudden looting just straight up is card draw. I would say there's a lot of cases even where that you don't care about your graveyard where it can still be card draw. I'm not sure that I would count a lot of looting as one of my 10 card draw spells. No, I don't don't think so either, unless your deck is very specifically meant to take advantage of it. Otherwise, it's just a good value engine to be able to see more of your deck. Now, looting combined with card draw is great because then you have lands to discard, dead cards, all that. So Sam specifically mentions tutors and cycling cards. And he's a little bit not sure about how to categorize them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, I don't know if you're the same for me, but my my thought was, and we talked about this a little with cantrips, no, those aren't exactly card draw. They're one for ones. And I think we've actually talked about this before and talking about tutors, how not to consider them card draw in the past. Um, it, It can definitely be confused easily, though, because you feel like you're in an advantage when you can find whatever card you want with a demonic tutor, right? You're right. like, whew, I'm, I'm good. I've got Cyclonic Rift in my hand <laughs> How for can the I rest lose? of the game. How can I lose? Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, a demonic tutor could go find you a card draw spell. So, uh-huh. in fact, I would say I very often tutor in some way for Aristic Study if I can tutor for it on turn two. Um, so I can play it right on time on turn three because that's just going to give me such an advantage throughout the course of the game. Yeah, definitely. Um, so tutors are modal spells, really. That's that's really how they play out, is that a, your tutor, 
especially something like Demonic it's Tutor. It's a really which, good way of looking at it. I never thought about it as a tutor, as a modal spell. Yeah, it's basically like every card in your deck plus two mana. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you know how modal spells will say, choose one, you know, give a target creature plus one, plus one, or counter target spell, or deal four damage to target opponent. Well, a Demonic Tutor says... <laughs> what is that card? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just designed a magic card. Wow, deals damage and counter spells? <laughs> Woo, let's go. I guess it's a red-blue spell. Um, but Demonic Tutor says... Every it has every effect in your deck, right? It says, yeah, you know, plus two mana. So it says pay five more mana and and cast Sarah Angel, or it says right. you know pay two and a white plus one and a black and play a Ghostly Prison. Like it, it and it, again, you can do it in installment plans. It's not exactly that, but that's the idea. That's how I think of tutors in my head. So you mm -hmm. could sort of count them as a card draw spell, but not because of that card. That's one of its modes if you have other card draw in your deck. Yeah, I guess Demonic Tutor is specifically, uh, again, it's a tutor that puts a card in your hand. Some some tutor is put on the top of your library, which in which case it's even less than card parity. But, That's true, it's card disadvantage then. But for something like Demonic Tutor, if, it, if, if Demonic Tutor just read uh, cast a spell, draw a card, it could be whatever card you want, then that would, you know, that would sort of read a little more as like, oh, I guess this does draw me a card but you're spending a spell to do it, so it's closer to a cantrip. In this case, that specifically will always get you exactly what you want. Now, again, if you don't have a card draw spell that it's going to go get, then it I wouldn't even count it as card draw at all. Mm -hmm. And then you're not always going to use it for that, but in those cases, that means you don't need card draw. So it's, it's a little bit of a foggy area, I would say. Like, And then there's things like Enlightened Tutor, Mystic Tutor, uh, things that are more specific. They can only get certain things. Like mm -hmm. Demonic's a special case, not special because Vampiric and a few others can do it, but in that, it gets literally any card. Yeah. All of a sudden, Mystic Tutor, it only gets instants and sorceries. Then I can only count that as card draw if I have instants and sorceries in my deck that I could go get with it that draw me cards. Yeah. So if I only got Mind's Eyes and Mystic Studies, then that's not a card draw spell in my deck. If I have Brain Geysers and Sphinx's Revelations, maybe. I don't know that I'd count it as a full of one of my 10. I might sort of count it as half. Yeah, and like honestly, if you're tutoring for a card you're almost very you're very rarely going to go for like a one-time card draw effect because like why are you doing that are you trying to find one card in particular with the card draw effect or do you need to find like two to three different cards in which case i wouldn't just go buy go like grab a brain geyser because the chances true. of you drawing it are not very high true i might if i was down to like one or two cards the, mm -hmm. that would be the instance where i really need it but you're right, right. so I, I wouldn't count tutors in general as card draw even though they can be but if I had like nine or 10 card draw spells in my deck that were sort of under like more like the examples that we talked about earlier, then I might count Demonic Tutor as like half a card draw spell. So I don't need my 10th. I've got seven tutors in my deck or something. I don't usually run that many, but right. you know, I, I could see that. Now, cycling is an ability that's on cards, and I would put Cantrip under a similar mm -hmm. thing, although Cantrips usually have an, some sort of minimal effect and they also draw you a card, but. Let's just put those as close to the same, where cycling is a card that literally says, discard this card, draw a new card. Yeah, and instant speed, which is yeah. kind of cool. Uh, the reason I like cycling is not because I think I see a card with cycling and go like, ooh, this card's very powerful. It's more like, how convenient that this card can replace itself. Uh, there are these great cycle of cycling lands. Yeah, I think the, the, those are very powerful. I then think. it's sort of similar to looting almost in mm -hmm. that how I was talking about you can sort of loot away a land and draw a real card, and that's card advantage in some ways because you're looting away... A dead card, otherwise. A dead card. One that you don't need, yeah. Yeah, and so that's the idea, I think, behind the cycling lands and why they come in all the commander pre-cons and such. They're, Very I smart. wouldn't Again, I wouldn't call them exactly card advantage, though, because a one-time, yeah. one-card thing is just hard to... It's not even really card draw. And it certainly, uh, to Sam's question, cannot replace a full dedicated card that's going to get you card draw or card advantage. Yeah, it would not count as one of my 10 for sure. It's yeah. nice to have um, on cards, but I wouldn't put them in there and be like, there, that I only had nine and now I have 10 card draw spells because <laughs> I put a cycler in. Um, th there's a special, another special area that we should talk about, which is called card selection. Mm. So card selection is the idea, ne not necessarily that you're going to draw extra cards, but you're going to get to choose from... A variety of cards from the top of your deck so the most classics or most powerful one is brainstorm mm -hmm. it's one blue mana for an instant it says draw three cards then put two cards from your hand on top of your library in any order so this actually like you played a card right and then you drew three cards but you put two back so you have the same amount of cards in your hand as when you started with brain geyser but you've got card selection because you actually drew three cards mm -hmm. and then you picked from all the cards you already had in your hand, including the new three ones, and put two back. So you can kind of 
draw three cards and put two lands down or put a card that you can't even cast yet down. Yep, or uh, a card that just isn't going to be good. Right, and you can sort of put it put it back on your library, and and then you uh, they use other things like fetch lands and things to shuffle it away so that yeah. you're not going to draw it. I mean, that's a whole other thing. But at the same time, Brainstorm really is card selection. you got the same amount of cards at the end of the day uh, that you had before, but you have different cards. Yeah, yeah, and I think that selection is really powerful. Uh, not as good in Commander when you just have better overall, like, I can just draw seven cards instead of having to put some back or whatever. But the sh- being able to shuffle it away is what really makes Brainstorm and a card like Sensei's Divining Top or scroll rack uh so since his divining top has an ability where you can look at the top three cards of your library and put them back in any order and you can also tap the top to draw a card so it actually isn't card advantage yeah when you tap the top to draw a card the top goes on top of your deck so yeah. you're actually replace. it's weird but it is weird and it's interesting because it's so the card's very good because it can protect itself if someone tries to get rid of it or there's an artifact board wipe you can draw the card and then the the divining top woo disappears back onto the top of your library but it is card selection, which is really important. Uh, I think Scroll Rack might be the most powerful out of uh, all of these. Scroll Rack is a really interesting card. I was talking to our friend Dan about it um, because he said, I just don't play this in any of my decks. And I go like, well, I play this in a lot of my decks because yeah, I have a lot. a lot of fetch lands as well to shuffle the cards away. It's a two-mana artifact where you can pay one and tap it to exile any number of cards from your hand face down and then put that many cards from the top of your library into your hand, then you can look at the cards you put face down and then put them back on top of your library in any order. So you can essentially control what order you draw the cards in. But more specifically, you're, you're, let's say you have a, a hand of seven. You only need one card that turn. You can put six cards away and draw six new, brand new cards and then decide how you want to order the other ones or shuffle them away or do whatever. But it's really interesting because you, you have massive card selection in this case. Yeah, because you're saying, oh, well, I don't want to select the cards that are on my, my hand. I want brand new ones from the top of my deck. It gives you ability to do it. It's not technically card draw. Now, it can get there like mm-hmm. when you've got fetch lands or things that are going to shuffle your deck or if you're putting lands down there that you don't want right now, things like that. It can sort of be pseudo card draw. Um, sometimes I count it as card draw depending on the deck. Sometimes I don't. I think a lot of people only use scroll, scroll rack in those decks like Jaleva yeah. and thing and Narsets, but it's re- actually very powerful. I'd say in mono white, mono red, Boros as like it sort of can stand in for a little bit for card draw. It's not the exact same, yeah, but it's very powerful. Yeah, and sometimes you just don't have what you need in your hand, and being able to look at X number of cards is pretty powerful because it's not you're not paying X to look at X cards. You're just literally dumping as many cards you want out of your hand, and it's really interesting. Uh, Another one that's similar is Sylvan Library. It's one in a green for an enchantment. At the beginning of your draw step, you may draw two additional cards. If you do, choose two cards in your hand drawn this turn. For each of those cards, pay for life or put the card on top of your library. So you can't brainstorm, right? You can't Mm -hmm. take the extra cards and then trade cards that were already in your hand for them. You just look at the three cards. You pick one to draw that turn, and then you either put the other two back or you pay for life each for each one you want to keep. Yeah, I mean, you're drawing three cards here, right? A turn, if you want to. That's card draw if you pay life. For eight life. Yeah. Uh, this adds up actually faster than yeah. I always expect. Yeah. I'm always just like, oh, sweet, Sylvan Library. Oh, God, I'm at 10 life. <laughs> <laughs> but the but then, thing is, if you don't pay the life, it's still card selection. Mm-hmm. So you're picking from three cards, you know, each turn, which you normally just get the random top one. So yeah. if there's a nine drop in there and you're on turn four, you can just be like, I'm not drawing that. But once I get to the enough mana, yeah, I'm going to draw it now. Yeah. And interestingly enough, this is advantage in a lot of ways because your opponent doesn't have that effect, right? If it just said, look, before you draw your card each turn, look at the top three cards and draw whatever one you want. I mean, everyone would die to have that effect if you just have it out. I'd say it's similar to scrying if you had like a scry one intermittently throughout the game. It's not the exact same, but I'd say value-wise you probably can squeeze, which we, I would say scry one is not exactly a card, but the farther into the game you get, the more it is a card because lands just become redundant at a certain point in the game. Yeah. And so scrying them down sort of can, can give you a card that you wouldn't otherwise have. So it sort of can be. There's there's a lot of gray areas with card draw. You wouldn't think there would be, right? It either draws your cards or it doesn't, but there there ends up being like a whole bunch of points where you're like, I don't know. that it's yeah. so, It can be. It might be. Yeah, in this case, it's kind of. I actually kind of like in the early game not having to scry it to the bottom because if it's a card you still want, Someday like, I want that card, and I don't yeah. want it to be on the bottom of my deck. As long as you're able to do like three, you can just keep, you know, keep it yeah. third from the bottom constantly. <laughs> um so Sam specifically mentioned Stone Hero Giant, Stoneforge Mystic, um, Godo Bandit Warlord, which are sort of equipment tutor creatures, and asks if they're card draw and if they're ramp. Mm-hmm. So 
this was an interesting one. It really got me thinking. And, you know, I think no, but then my brain, then of course I was like, okay, but why is it no? Why is it not card draw? Because it does give you cards in the way that card advantage, like Reese does, right? Right. But I think that it's not. And to answer why it's not, we kind of have to say answer this question, which is funny to answer, but once you start thinking of it, it's interesting, which is why is card draw good? I mean, we preach about it all the time. What about it is so essential? Consistency. Consistency. Yeah. So this is sort of where we delineate from card advantage and why card draw is good on its own, not just because of card advantage. So card mm-hmm. advantage, again, is the attrition war. My cards trade for your cards. Eventually, if I am sort of more efficient and some of my cards are either creating new cards from nowhere or drawing me more cards or killing more of your cards than the cost of the one card, then I sort of have more cards than you do and I can sort of overwhelm you that way. Well, card draw doesn't work in exactly that way or that's not the only reason it's good. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not just about having more cards in your hand. It's actually, I mean, it is about having more cards in your hand, but it's actually so that you can have options. Yeah. Right? Like, what's a very basic thing about magic? Hitting your land drops? Hitting all your land drops. Well, card draw does that. Board wipes don't do that. Mm -hmm. They can give you card advantage, but they're not going to make it so that you make sure you hit your fifth land, your sixth land, your seventh land, your eighth land on time. Card draw can do that because by drawing enough cards, you just even out the consistency of the the variables, right? Over enough time, you're going to draw an average amount of land, and so you'll be able to play. Yeah, it's also the most reliable way to make sure that you're still in the game. Uh, because a lot of times, you'll see someone get outraced by someone that's just like dumping lands out because of a burgeoning or you know something like that. And in this case, having card draw is great because let's say you just you're like, shoot, I can't keep up with this person. I, I'm playing a Boros deck. I can't drop lands like they are, but I can at least play these cards that i know that i will have because of card draw like if i didn't have these cards otherwise i would be super behind but now that i can be a little more consistent with my deck and a little i can still have i have still have a dog in this fight right i I also think it's important for hitting your ramp spells and your ramp stuff early like Mm -hmm. drawing a gilded lotus on turn 13 we've all done it it's like okay i play it like you just (laughs) feel bashful about it but if when you drop it on time it's great because it 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 makes your sixth turn actually your ninth turn. Like, yeah. that's a crazy leap. But the, your 13th turn actually being your 16th turn, eh, not as big of a deal. Yeah. Um, so again, if you just draw more cards, then all of a sudden you're just hitting your stuff on time, right? You're, what's what's the, um, there's like that overarching theory of magic, which is basically one of the things is like, use all your mana every turn. Right, use, yeah, use your mana efficiently and use as use it all if you can because that means that you are doing... Like, if your opponent has six mana out and they're still playing cards that cost two mana and you're playing cards that cost two cards that cost three or whatever or six mana total for a card, you're, in general, going to be doing better than that player because those higher-costed cards are more powerful, typically. Yeah, it's another theory of magic, right? It's just, like, the winner eventually is the person that spent more the most mana over the game. Mm-hmm. None of these are end-all, be-all. It's just kind of like card advantage. But it is a, a metric by which you can sort of measure you know, who's ahead or who's going to eventually come out ahead. Yeah. So your ability to um, use all your mana every turn efficiently is sort of predicated on the options available to you, right? If you've got two cards in your hand, they cost five and six. You either need 11 mana or six mana. Right. Or five mana. Like you can't do, if you have nine mana, you're just going to waste at least three of it. That's just the way it goes. If you have 12 cards in your hand, you can find the right combination to add up to the most efficient use of that mana. So that's mm-hmm. another reason card draw is good is just to give you those options to be really efficient with your mana. Yeah, or if your creature has an activated ability that costs three mana, you can you know do something for three mana and use that ability at the end of turn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then another thing is just having the right answers at the right time. We talked about this in a couple of episodes, yeah. which is like this is one of the things you'll notice about about really good players is they seem to just have the answer to that infinite combo or that guy that's going to attack them or you know that enchantment or that indestructible flying angel, 8-8 right. angel. And one of the ways that, that really good players tend to have those answers is they just have a lot of cards in their hand, and that just gives them a way higher percentage chance of having the answer, right? Yeah, and also using the, the for instance, having Cryptic Command is a great counterspell, but if you're forced to use it and you just, let's say you know your deck has other counterspells, like, dang, I could have used it in the gate there, but I used my Cryptic Command. 
that means that the person that had more cards in their hand had the option of using the correct spell at the right time so they could save the right spell for the right time. Right. They weren't like, well, I, I don't want to waste this now, but it's my only option, so I have to do it. Whereas yeah. if I had more cards, I could use one of the sort of better options now and save the really strong card for later. Um, so not all cards have to do all of this to be card draw, but I think they should hit multiple areas, which is why I think Stoneforge doesn't really count as card draw. It does tutor for equipment. Mm-hmm. But, and, and it's really powerful. I don't think it has to do with power level of the card. Stoneforge Mystic, one of the most powerful cards in the history of Magic. Yeah. It's just, I don't think she can help you hit your land drops. I don't think she can help you, you know, use your mana the most efficiently. Uh, in some decks, maybe. Maybe she can go get Skull Clamp, and if your deck's set up to use Skull Clamp, then all of a sudden she right. is a little bit more card draw. Maybe. Yeah, she's card advantage in the way that at the end of the day you have a creature that can do cool things. You know, it can it can drop the stuff on the board. So in a way she ramps you, but she still isn't card draw in the way that we've defined it. And again, I wouldn't count her as ramp either because of how narrow she is. She only yeah. ramps your artifacts. That doesn't ramp any of the other stuff that you may need to do. Yeah, your so, equipment specifically. Again, really good card. I wouldn't put her in either the ramp or the card draw category. Yeah, you definitely should not replace a card with Stoneforge Mystic. Um, even if you have a card that says find, uh, you know, like open the armory, which is like find an aura or an equipment, it's it's not the same. It's a tutor. It's a tutor, yeah. So see, she's essentially a tutor on a stick. So if you can blink her repeater, then that is a ton of card advantage, but still isn't necessarily card draw. Yeah. Um, all right, so... I think that hopefully this will give you a good insight into how we think about card draw, why we think it's so important. Mm-hmm. I think card advantage is also important. Important. It's sort of a, another thing entirely. Like we don't go around saying like you need ten card draw spells, ten mana ramp spells, and ten card advantage spells, because card advantage is sort of it's on a lot more stuff, especially in EDH. Um, yeah, it's much more nebulous too. To yeah, trying to find with a card. I think you get. St- into dangerous territory if you start doing things like counting a board wipe as your 10 card draw spells right or, i mean you have a lot of board wipes i wow. still want <laughs> i still want those cards in my deck but i don't count them as card draw spells because yeah. what will happen is i'll start eating into the consistency of my deck i won't hit my land drops i won't cast my ramp spells on time i won't have the answers when i need them that really hurts you yeah i agree it's 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 a really interesting question i think every deck also is very unique in how it deals with card advantage and card draw and it's going to be tough. I, I know everyone wants to play every sweet spell in the world, but having consistency has to be the most important part of an EDH deck for me because there have been way too many times in my early EDH career where I sit at the board and everyone else is going off doing cool things, and because of one like discard spell, I have nothing in my hand. I have no way of getting it back, and I'm just drawing empty every single time, just hoping that I'm finding one of the few card draw spells in my deck. I'm like, maybe I should have put more in there. I, I would also quantify it in terms of fun. It's... yeah. It's way more fun to be involved in the game, even if you lose, than it is to not just feel like you're not involved in the game. And only having one card and just top decking and hoping it's good, and then it's a land and you play it and you go, and you didn't actually get to do anything. Whereas sometimes, yeah, you draw a lot of cards and you get overrun by something else, but at least you're in that game. You have options. When the turn's about to come to you, like, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. Mm -hmm. That's just more fun, uh, at least for me, and I think generally for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's generally more fun for everyone. I mean, at least you're not going to... I mean, it is a really bad feeling when you're sitting there being like, okay, I'm not doing anything, wasting my time. I could be playing my deck, but I'm actually just kind of watching while being a wounded soldier in the, in the corner that's over the here. worst <laughs> it's the worst so do not scrimp on card draw you want at least 10 uh, i often have a little bit more than that um just because i'm greedy because like i said sure sometimes i may lose a game or two to just having too much card draw and not enough stuff that actually does things but those games are still fun because i can still like i still have things to do yeah it's better than the alternative yeah that's for sure um all right to the listeners first of all thank you sam for the great email and here's your you. here's your bundle of Kaladesh. Here's a bundle. It's from Watsi also, I don't think we said. So oh, Wizards, that's right. Wizards of the Coast was very kind to send us um, those Planeswalker decks, the bundles. We have a booster box, another bundle, I think, and a couple mm-hmm. more Planeswalker decks. So we're going to be giving those away. Um, the best way to be involved in the, those types of contests is to follow us on Twitter at CommandCast if you want a chance to win that stuff. Also, you can send us emails like Sam's. Yeah. We love getting emails. Sometimes we just reply to them if it's not as major of a question. Uh, but there have been many cases in the past now where an email has spurred a discussion or had me and Josh look at each other and be like, huh, 
we haven't really talked about that, have we? Or like when we did talk about it, we didn't go as in-depth as we wanted. So emails are a great way to get involved. We're not going to guarantee a prize, obviously, for every time someone sends an email. I but wouldn't. if we pick you and we highlight it in the show, I think we can safely say that anytime we do a real highlight of somebody on the show, they usually get something. Yeah. So the joy that's just the kind of, of guys we are. featured on the Command Zone <laughs> podcast. So send in those questions, those topic ideas, anything you, any thoughts you have or interesting deep dives on the format that you want us to go into. We love getting that stuff. Uh, yeah. And congrats, Sam, on congrats, your Kaladesh buddy. bundle. I'm pretty sure, don't want to guarantee it, but that you're going to open a, what's a good one, Mana Vault? Mana Vault, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, maybe Soul a Soul Ring. Ring. I heard Soul that card's pretty good. I think Aether Vial, just, just as far as value. Yeah. Uh, Lotus and Petal as Mox well for Opal, value. I think. Mox Opal, oh, Yeah, those are the playable. And, uh, they're so Chromatic beautiful. Lantern for EDH. Send Scroll us a rack. picture. If you, Sam, if you open one of us, send Actually, us a picture. Actually, if, if, if you guys ever get a prize, please tweet at us a picture of what you opened, even if it was nothing, because I like seeing it. And it makes us happy. Sometimes we retweet it. Because I'm happy coming along in the room without a roof. Hey, everyone. How's it going? You're listening to an episode of The Command Zone. <laughs> we got two songs. And we are brought That's to... That's card advantage. That is card advantage. <laughs> um, and again, a reminder that this show is brought to you by the one and only CardKingdom.com. Make sure you guys go to CardKingdom.com slash Command Zone if you want to support the show. That's our affiliate link. It lets them know that you came from our podcast and uh, buy some stuff, you know. There's you know, lots of good stuff out right now. You know, I've heard a lot of MTG Finance people talking about how the um, the inventions are actually kind of low right now, lower than most people expected. I think the fervor for them hasn't really kicked in the way that a lot of people thought. So in Certainly. the next couple of weeks, I think they're going to be at the lowest they're ever going to be. So it might be a good time to order any of those Kaladesh yeah. inventions that you want. Order them from Card Kingdom. Use the affiliate link. And you know they're going to be in pristine condition. And they're going to get there fast. Yeah. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone. All right. Time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. I have something. Yeah. Escape rooms. Oh. <laughs> so I did my first escape room. Jimmy, I know you've done a few. Yep. They're so much fun. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what took me so long. It's so, it's like, as soon as I was in there for 30 seconds, I was like, this is like it's so exactly right up my alley. Why has it taken so long? Anybody it's like that, an adult puzzle room. Yeah, anybody that likes magic will love it. It's, yeah, oh, uh, definitely. It's Yeah, it's like a live-action video game, kind of. It's like a cross between a uh, murder mystery party and playing the video game Myst. Yeah, but m more fast-paced, working with friends, and put in really cool situations. If you guys don't know, an escape room is essentially a puzzle room of sorts where you go in with a group of friends, and you're presented with a task or a puzzle or something to figure out a mystery, and you have a set amount of time to go through this room that's been custom-designed, and every little bit and interaction in there is designed to have you solve some puzzles, do some tricks, and... You know, find clues and then solve riddles, solve riddles, and then get to whatever the end result is. So it's different for every escape room. Yeah, a lot of the rooms are to just get out of the room. So you'll yeah. get in and escape then the room. They'll be like, <laughs> yeah, you'll just have to start looking around the room, and they'll they'll probably give you like a backstory of something about the room, and then you'll start going like, oh, well, the statue's looking over there, and you go over there and you open up the books, and inside the yeah. book there's a key, and then you try a bunch of locks and you open that lock, and then there's a riddle inside the lock, and you solve the riddle, and that blah blah blah, and it leads you on to the thing until eventually, if you're good you get out the room yeah and maybe in record time maybe in there record are time. escape rooms in every single state i'm pretty sure in the united states they're all around the world as well i remember being in hong kong and seeing escape rooms there it's it's sort of this like slow growing a uh, worldwide phenomenon yeah and each escape room is different unique but done by different companies you know what it reminded me of it reminded me of the last crusade yes uh, <laughs> yeah it's a lot like the last crusade so at the end where uh he's going to get the holy grail and there's a lot of these little he's got to figure out like you know, spell the right word. Or, yeah, yeah. Just don't step on these things to not die. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's it's great you, though. Don't worry, you won't. You can't die though. Yeah, no. that's it's just simu no, no, no. it's simulated danger. <laughs> um, so if you have not tried an escape room, get some of your friends together. It is a group thing. Uh, Google escape room in your area. Try it out. I guarantee it's really awesome. I had a great time. Yeah, you're gonna love it. All right, something else that's really awesome is our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern. Hey! Alex Kessler, who just made his first day two at a GP ever at GP Atlanta. Amazing. Yeah, congrats. Playing, uh, playing Sealed, congrats. And um, Ben Bateman is the other host. They talk about 
Ben All Bateman th- made day two before Kessler did. Oh, he did at yeah. GP Vegas last year. I wonder if he's going to go for a repeat this uh, next year, 2017. I'm going for a, a, not a repeat. I'm going for a not play in the main event, but <laughs> that's a whole other story. Anyway, those guys talk about uh, modern as a format, all things competitive magic. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast. And our editor for the show is Terry Robertson. That's right, full video for all of our shows. You can go to youtube.com slash the command zone podcast to find videos for all of our episodes. Anytime we mention a card, it pops up on screen. Screen, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, there was a comment on like a very old episode being like, oh, the, the cards don't pop up for long enough. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, you should check out the current episodes because the show has been improving ever since uh, we've gotten Terry on the show. It's great. There's, It's so interactive. There's tons of fun stuff, little video clips that are thrown in there as well. So, Oh, Terry does an amazing job. Yeah, so make sure you check that out. It's youtube.com slash the Command Zone Podcast. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living cards animations that start the show and are peppered throughout. You can find him on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. Man, I keep forgetting to do this. Oh, one. Oh. oh man, I missed. Oh jeez. We just blew out the mics. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening, <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>